Hi, welcome back to Earth Materials. Today I want to talk about light and color in minerals, and I must say I'm very indebted to Julia Nord and Brian Balta for providing a lot of the materials I'm going to be talking about today. So the first thing I want to talk about is why we even see color in materials, and then I want to discuss some of the drivers of color in minerals. There's a nice review article by NASA published in 1978. This is posted on the Mineralogical Society of America website for free if you care to read about it. And some of the figures I'm going to show you come from that publication. There are various drivers of color in minerals, and I will be talking about all of these different things. And I will be talking about all of these. So at the end of this, I hope students have a better understanding of the different ways that color can form in minerals. And then if you see a particular color in a mineral and you know something about its chemistry or chemical substitutions, to hypothesize what might be responsible for giving rise to color in that mineral. So the first thing to talk about is why do we even see any color? If we take as an example the color red in an apple, the light that shines on the apple has all of the different colors in it. We have a complete spectrum here. But either all of the wavelengths of light are absorbed except for red, which is reflected so that we see red, or red is transmitted if it's a transparent material and the other wavelengths are absorbed. Most color in minerals is a response to the interaction between the electronic structure of atoms and light. Now these interactions occur over the entire energy spectrum or wavelength of light, but our eyes can only interpret wavelength ranges between 400 and 700 nanometers. So there can be interactions that impact infrared radiation or ultraviolet radiation, but we don't happen to see those. When there are those interactions that occur in the visible range, that's when material is seen as having color. It's important that the electronic transition in atoms are quantized. So these levels here are meant to represent energy levels in an atom. So these could correspond to different orbitals, although they could also correspond to other energy levels that I'll talk about later on. Now, electromagnetic radiation can interact with electrons to cause them to jump from a lower state to a higher state. If that happens, that wavelength of light will be absorbed. It will not be transmitted. Now, if electrons drop from a higher energy state to a lower energy state, then they will emit light corresponding to that energy difference and then they will fluoresce or emit that wavelength of light. So some wavelengths of light can be absorbed, which means electrons are being excited from lower energy states to higher energy states. But some wavelengths of light are also being emitted as electrons drop from higher energy states to lower energy states. If we look at a single element, so for example, if we look at hydrogen and we heat it up, the extra energy pushes electrons from lower energy states to higher energy states. As they relax from the higher energy states back to the lower energy states, they emit light. And that light has characteristic wavelengths. For hydrogen, that corresponds to a red emission line, a green emission line, and a couple of purple emission lines. Now, our eyes can't distinguish this. We, we are not spectrometers. So our eyes will mix these different wavelengths together to create the color light that we see here. Now that's the emission of hydrogen. Hydrogen will also absorb light. So if we take the complete electromagnetic spectrum and we shine it through hydrogen, hydrogen will absorb those same energy differences. Now, complex compounds and minerals do not have simple absorption and emission spectra. Here, for example, are the absorption spectra for chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B. These are two types of chlorophyll that occur in plants. And you can see here that both absorb in the red spectrum and in the blue spectrum. And that means that they reflect in the yellow to green part of the spectrum. 
But these are continuous absorption bands. They're not discrete absorption bands. So instead of having a line here, there's actually a curve. And chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B are different compounds, so they have different absorptions, and consequently they show up as different colors. Chlorophyll A is more in the blue-green, whereas chlorophyll B is more in the yellow-green. So the color that we see depends on how the mineral structure interacts with wavelengths of visible light, and then also how our eyes respond to each wavelength. Now what do minerals look like? Here, for example, is the absorption spectrum for olivine. Olivine is typically a beautiful green, and what's happening is it's absorbing in the red part of the spectrum, and it's absorbing in the blue to violet part of the spectrum, and transmitting the green to yellow part of the spectrum preferentially. If we look at almondine, almondine garnet, shown here, this spectrum actually absorbs substantially in the red part of the spectrum, but much less than in the yellow, green, blue, and violet part of the spectrum over here. So what we see transmitted is dominated by the red part of the spectrum, and that's why garnets are typically red. Then if we look at a mineral like chrysoberyl, here's the spectrum for chrysoberyl, Chrysoberyl can have slight color, but it tends to transmit pretty uniformly through much of the spectrum. And so typically, chrysoberyls don't have very much color. If they do, they tend to be in the yellow-orange part of the spectrum. OK, so now I hope you have a better sense of why we see color in minerals in the context of the absorption and transmission of light. But what is it that actually drives color in minerals? The general term that we use for the part of a molecule or compound that's responsible for color is its chromophore. The chromophores are often a small percentage of the component in a mineral. They can be less than 1% of the atoms in a mineral. There are four types that directly relate to electronic transitions. We'll talk about metal ions in octahedral coordination, intervalence charge transfer, some odd features of color centers and band gaps. And then there's another feature which is unrelated to electrons directly, and these colors are a manifestation of physical effects. So again, just to reiterate that within the context of electron transitions, there are different energy levels in atoms, and that if light excites an electron from one energy state to a higher energy state, that wavelength will be absorbed, whereas if it drops from one energy state to another energy state, that light will be emitted or fluoresced. So here's an example with ruby, and what we can see is that light will be absorbed if it has an energy level of 3 electron volts or 2.23 electron volts. Okay, so what does that correspond to? 3 is up here in the blue-violet re region, 2 is in the yellow-green region. These excited states will drop down eventually to this lower energy state. There is energy that's being emitted, but it's in the infrared region, so we don't see that emission. Once it reaches this energy state and drops back down to the ground state, then it is fluorescing that energy, and that energy is in the red region. So that's why ruby is red. It's absorbing in the higher energy part of the spectrum, and it is emitting in the lower energy part of the spectrum. So the whole idea of light in minerals that relates to electron energies is how can we absorb certain wavelengths of light, how can we emit certain wavelengths of light, and how can these different energy levels be developed in elements to cause these kinds of absorptions and emissions. Well, metal ions are some of the most common causes of color in silicate minerals. The transition metals occupy this part of the periodic table. And what's important here is that these are the elements that have 3D electrons. Now, the 3D orbitals have two distinct shapes. In two of these orbitals, electrons point in the direction of the primary axes. And in the other three orbitals, the electrons point in between the axes. 
Now, why does that matter? That's because the axes point towards the oxygen atoms within the metal octahedra. So if you have a metal ion that is in an octahedron, these two electron orbitals point towards oxygen atoms, and these electron orbitals point in between oxygen atoms. So although the average energy of all of these orbitals is the same, they actually split their energies such that the orbitals where the electrons are pointing towards the oxygens have a higher energy, and the orbitals that where the electrons point in between the oxygen atoms have a lower energy. This splits the energy into an electronic jump, and this jump turns out to correspond to the visible range of light. So here's a quick question. Which of the following elements, which could all be in octahedral coordination, would be more likely to produce strongly colored minerals? And the answer is iron. Iron is the only transition metal out of these elements. And here's an example of phaolite, which is an iron-rich olivine.